So today we're gonna to be doing something similar to yesterday, actually. I've got the whiteboard, I'm here with Chance. We're gonna be talking about an interesting concept today. Today it's gonna to be how to prepare for a competition. So if you've ever prepared for a competition before, you probably know it's one of the most nerve wracking, adrenaline inducing experiences you can possibly have. It's stressful and emotional and mentally draining and physically draining and it takes a lot of preparation. I'm gonna give you a few select ways that can help you prepare for a jiu-jitsu competition. Let's head over to the whiteboard. Here we are. <laughs> So just to make this simple, let's separate what competition preparedness is into three phases, our familiar three phases. We have the physical preparation, we have the mental preparation, and we have the technical preparation. I think physical is the place you have to start. You have to be prepared physically so that you're not going in there as just a soft bag of meat. You know, you have to go in there as somewhat of a hardened individual. And that, that doesn't mean hardened in relation to all of jujitsu, but at least your specific division. You wanna be a little bit tougher than everyone else. Competition is a very aggressive experience. The guys or girls gonna grab you and shake you. They're gonna shake the shit out of you. They're gonna hold on so tight, their muscles are gonna feel like iron. That's what it feels like, because that's what adrenaline feels like. To prepare for that, you kind of need to become that. You need to also be able to exert force on another person, or be able to accept that gracefully and be like more like a rubber band man, absorbing the aggression that they bring at you. So the simplest way to do that is to gain cardio confidence. If someone's stronger than you, there's not that much you can do about it. Some people are just stronger than you. But cardio confidence is gonna give you the ability to know that maybe that person is strong now in the beginning of the match, but as time goes on, minute two, minute three, minute four, their strength is gonna wane. Your cardio is gonna be level at the very least. So they may start here, but your cardio is level and then their strength is gonna diminish. And then at a certain inflection point, bam, your cardio will now be more valuable than their strength as their strength starts to wear off. So how do we achieve cardio confidence? Well, there's a simple thing you can do. First, we do a simple calculation. How many matches are you gonna have in your tournament? Is, if it's a singular match, that's a different story. But let's assume that this is a bracketed event, that you haven't been invited to a who's number one or some super fight event. Let's say you have five matches. So you have five by five minute matches. So each match is gonna be about five minutes. So at the very least, you need to have 25 minutes of cardio, right? This could be a potential of 25 minutes of the hardest struggle of your life because that's what competition feels like. And I'm not gonna pull any punches there. Competition is one of the hardest things you'll ever do in your life, physically, mentally, emotionally, technically. So if you need to have cardio for 25 minutes, if you expect to win, that's tough. Have you ever grappled for a 25 minute round? Most people haven't. But the important thing to understand is, okay, if I'm gonna be grappling for 25 minutes against a bunch of different people, there's a chance that my first match of five minutes, the guy is super fresh and really tries to kill me and give it his all. And he hasn't considered that he has 20 more mid minutes of matches left. You should consider that. So if someone is being overly aggressive and trying really hard, it may be best to kind of chill a little bit if you think you can beat this guy. Of course, you have to turn it up. If they're kicking your ass, you're gonna have to fight hard as well. But how do you even have the ability to gauge that? The only way is to work this into your training. So when you're training, you have to train for more than 25 minutes. So if your gym is only doing, you know, five five minute rounds or six five minute rounds or three five minute rounds some gyms only do, you're not even nearly close enough to this 25 minute mark to have confidence. Your cardio will not be confident. You're maybe right at the line. You're gonna finish that competition and you're gonna be like, holy crap, that was way harder than the five rounds I do in my gym. That's the reality, that's the slap in the face when you go to a competition and you think, oh yeah, I do five minute rounds all the time in my gym. I do five, five minute rounds. How is this any different? It's way different. It's three times harder in a competitive setting. So you need to be able to grapple for about three times longer than 25 minutes. So whatever you're gonna be competing at, however long you could potentially be fighting, your training should really consist of three times this. Now that doesn't mean every day, but there definitely needs to be a part of your sparring throughout the week, which I'll get to. You wanna to get to at least seven to 10 hours of sparring a week if you really wanna be prepared. But there's gonna be days where you should be doing five 10 minute rounds. That would at least get you to double 50 minutes, right? If we do five 10 minute rounds in training. That, obviously that sounds like a lot. For a lot of people, 10 minutes is an eternity. I couldn't grapple 10 minutes. Well. 
If you can grapple 10 minutes and your opponents can only grapple five minutes because they never actually took the time to try and push themselves and see if they're capable of, capable of more, you will have a significant confidence, cardio confidence advantage, which helps with your mental game. So cardio confidence is something that I always rely on because it's the simplest, ba most basic metric of where you stand for a competition. If you know that you can outlast people in cardio, you always have that in your back pocket beyond some tricky technique that you know, beyond strength, beyond speed, beyond your talent level, beyond maybe even your show pony-esque ability to show up and do well in competitions. If you don't have confidence in your cardio, there will be a point in your match where you feel tired and that will feel like death. When you get tired in the middle of a match and someone's just pounding on you, passing your guard like a crazy person, it breaks you. And so this is how you avoid getting broken in a competition. And this is what breaks 90% of people who go out there for the first time or even the second time or even the 10th time. They fail to put effort into their cardio confidence and they break, okay? Another thing you can do to improve your confidence is achieve impressive strength. Now Chance, you've had to do this before. You needed to get stronger, right? It helps to be strong. If you're avoiding your strength, you're gonna run into the same scenario where your cardio has was not good enough. If you're not quite strong enough, you will become overwhelmed because some people take competition very seriously and just showing up, you owe yourself and you owe your training part or your, comp your competitors the respect of trying to be the best version of yourself. So you definitely need to be hitting lifts, some sort of strength training. This will help with injuries, it'll help with your actual movements out in the competition so you don't get thrown around. It'll protect you in a lot of different ways. And I don't view strength as like an offensive capability as much as I view it as a defensive capability. If you're strong, it's gonna support your cardio. So these two things kind of go hand in hand. If you have the impressive strength, that doesn't mean use it. That means it will save you when things go bad. If someone was about to pass your guard and you have that one extra rep of a big push because you're on the bench all day, that helps. And it helps with your cardio because it allows you to not have to struggle as much to accomplish a specific task in the match. So let's move on. We need our seven to 10 hours of sparring over drilling. You notice I put sparring above drilling because sparring will always be more important for competition than drilling. You can drill, if, if you take two groups of people from white belt to black belt and one group only drills and one group only spars, which one do you think is gonna win in the end? Obviously the people who've spent more time live sparring are gonna be in better shape have a better understanding of jujitsu, and they would crush the people who only drill. Obviously, that's an extreme, uh, you know, ultimatum scenario, but you wanna be getting a little bit more sparring than you are drilling. Of course, regulate as needed. But seven to 10 hours is like, you will be in shape. That's a lot of training. Most people won't hit that because it takes a little bit more time, but if you have the opportunity to dedicate two months of a camp to prepare for your competition, you really should be trying to aim for something like this. Even if it's like one hour of sparring or 45 minutes of sparring and 30 minutes of drilling, I mean, you could do that once a day. For, you could do that six days a week. How, how you divvy that up is up to you. Some people like to get two sessions in a day on a Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then take it easier on Thursday or Tuesday, Thursday. But that's up to you, but you should be aiming for this. If you go to a competition and you don't have this many hours of sparring and you lose, that's on you because really you need to be hitting this metric to be able to expect to win against someone else who's gonna be, because other people will be training this much. Okay, let's move on to mental. But the mental aspect is just as important as the physical. The physical supports the mental, the mental supports the physical, but you need to be in the right headspace because humans, we're complex creatures. We have a broad spectrum of emotions and experiences and feelings any little thing that goes wrong in your life can affect you in competition. Maybe you had a fight with your girlfriend the week before and you're still thinking about it. Maybe someone's there watching you and you're nervous about it. Maybe this is your first competition in a while and you're a little rusty and you don't wanna lose in front of your friends. Or maybe it's your first competition. Or maybe you're just nervous for no reason. Maybe you're throwing up and you're nervous just at that you're gonna throw up. Like, oh my God, I'm gonna throw up here because I always throw up at competitions. Those are all realities of competition that you have to accept. Don't hide from them. Don't shy away from the discomfort. Don't avoid the, ang the nerves. Don't avoid throwing up. I've, I've seen that people who try and suppress those natural reactions to a fight or flight scenario, which is what a competition is, at least to your base limbic system, thinks you're about to die or fight for your, <laughs> fight for your life. 
a lot of stuff is gonna be happening. And the more you try and restrict that and suppress it leading up to the competition, the more it's gonna hit you on that day like a tsunami. So you're kind of like holding back the flood, trying to avoid those pangs of nervousness and distress leading up to the competition. And then when you get there, because you haven't dealt with them and like integrated them into yourself yet, it's going to crush you and it's gonna be incredibly traumatic and it's gonna make you hate the competitive scene only because of procrastination. You procrastinated dealing with it. So that's where affirmations and being there visually come in. Affirmations are what you aspire to be. You need to set an ideal for yourself. What do you want to be? How, how much do you want to win? Do you wanna be number one in this tournament? Do you just wanna place? Do you just wanna feel like you got there and participated? Like there's levels of what you dictate your success is, but whatever that level of success that you deem is your ideal, you need to be affirming that to yourself that you're gonna be able to accomplish that. The easiest way to do that is to come up with a little mantra, a simple mantra. And some people, they don't like the idea of affirmations, like, oh, how does just repeating something make it happen? Like all of, all of that, like you become your, your reality or you create your own reality. It's like, sounds like wonky mumbo jumbo. But what this is really doing is just kind of like presenting to your brain, like I can do better. I can be better. I will be better. I want to become this. Maybe it's not me now, but I want to aim towards that. So it's kind of like your guiding star. And this is a really important thing to put thought into because it's gonna program your brain. It's gonna program your brain to think in a certain way and to behave in a certain way. So something that I used to have a problem with was I, I would go to competitions and I wouldn't like fight for the submission. I would like try and win on points or I would like be careful and I would like feel like going for submissions was a risk. So I came up with some affirmations that were, were affirming to myself that I was a submission hunter. I wanted to submit people. I didn't want to be the kind of person who got, went and won a competition or lost a competition with no submissions involved. I, I wanted to live or die by the sword. Submission is the mission. So I had a few affirmations, which I'm going to keep private because they're kind of funny and weird because your affirmations can be because no one else has to know about these. This is something for you that's personal that you say to yourself, but you have to say it to yourself every day. This is an everyday thing. This one, affirmations. I can give you a little example. Chance, do you mind if we use you for this example? Yeah, sure. So Chance is a fantastic grappler. He has a lot of technical knowledge. He's very proficient in his movements. And you can see when he rolls that he understands jujitsu and he understands the techniques and he performs them flawlessly, I must say, Chance. However, there's a little bit of a hesitation. He hesitates a lot because he thinks that when he takes a shot, that someone's gonna stop it. Like he just assumes that the shot or the takedown is gonna fail. And maybe you don't realize this chance, but a part of you shoots and you think, oh, they must do something now, so I should stop. And that is just, that is something that happens to everyone, a sort of hesitation, a sort of um, just being apprehensive about committing to things and understanding that like, hey, at a certain point, you just got send it man you just got to go for it and commit through the takedown and take that person down so i would say a good affirmation for chance would be something like i am good at jujitsu i have good takedowns when i shoot people hit the mat like i'm gonna go through them i they are a wall i'm gonna visually in my own mind be like i am chance i'm a fantastic wrestler i'm gonna take these motherfuckers down and no one's gonna stop me and that's kind of how you have to be because that is your ideal it's a confident aggressive grappler that's what you sh you could be chance and that's what you are becoming right as as we kind of go through your process of learning and lifting and you've been putting a lot of effort into impressive strength your cardio confidence is needs a little bit of work but you're getting there um and you're definitely not quite hitting this full seven to ten hours but you're also not training for a competition so i think you're doing just fine with your impressive strength and your affirmations that you've been doing. And a lot of, you don't have to hit every single one of these, but just hitting any smattering of them, a couple, three, four, that's a great place to start. You obviously don't have to do everything every single time. Now, affirmations, super important. Be there visually. I kind of just described this also. You want to visualize yourself in that place. So if you've ever been to a competition before, put yourself back there, flex your imagina imagination muscle, when you're out on the mat and you're about to slap bump with some people, I will visually put myself there. Like I'm across the mat from some person I'm afraid of. That's usually who I pick. Someone who I'm afraid of that I've lost to before. And it's like, okay, I'm there. How do I like, I'm here. The ref is here. The crowd is here. And I can force myself into that mindset. And I make eye contact because eye contact was something that I did as an affirmation because I wanted to exude confidence. So I would make eye contact with people because nothing is more 
confident than eye contact, right? If you re- like, it's overbearing. Someone gets in your face and makes eye contact with you. It makes you uncomfortable. And it made me uncomfortable when people did it to me. And I was like, I don't like that I'm uncomfortable with that eye contact. I want to affirm that I'm the guy who makes people uncomfortable with eye contact. So I, I took that weakness and I made it a strength and it worked really well for me. People would be very intimidated. I shaved my head. I got like fully into it, right? And I did it. I became what I visualized and I became what I affirmed. And that was super helpful for me. And so that's a very flexible tool that you can use in very different ways. You have to want it. This kind of goes with affirmations also. If you're forcing yourself to do this and it's like you feel pressured in any way from someone else, your parents, your coaches, your friends, or yourself, a lot of times it's not, it's not real pressure, of course. Like obviously you shouldn't feel pressure to do it if someone's pressuring you, that's not real pressure. They're trying to influence you to accomplish something that they think would be good for you, I'm sure. However, you need to want this for yourself. You have to want to be there and you have to want to win. There's nothing worse than doing all this stuff, preparing for it, but then not actually wanting to be there on the day of the competition. You get to the competition and you're like, fuck, I can't wait for this to be over. Like I, I signed up to this thing, this sucks, I'm tired. I drank a bunch of coffee and now I feel jittery. I feel like I'm gonna throw up. I feel like I'm gonna crap my pants. Like all sorts of re- the realities of competition can start beating you down. Even if you did want to be there, these thoughts are gonna creep in and just corrupt your mind and make you feel like you wanna quit and leave. Don't, never give up. That brings me to never give up. No matter what vindicative, evil little voice in your head tells you how worthless you are and how much you suck and how much this is gonna be terrible and your experience, is gonna be awful and you just wanna leave, say fuck you, little guy in my head that's being negative. I don't need you here. Never give up. You have to stay confident and you have to fight that voice in your head because everyone has that little voice in their head. And all of the mental training is really just to prepare for the first match of the day, which is that fucking little guy in your head. That's, that's always the first match of the day, is how do you beat that guy? Because if, if you can't even beat that guy who's inside your own head, you're never gonna beat round one. Because anyone who makes it, or at least round two, because anyone who makes it to round two, round three, round four, they already beat that little guy in their head to some extent, or at least pummeled him into submission until he recovers and attacks you at the next event. So never give up, no matter what your inner voice says, that will help you a lot. So I could go way deeper into these, but you can look them up on your own and kind of imagine how you can use this for yourself. And maybe we'll make a full course on it one day. But for today, Let's just move on. So the next one is deliberate practice. We talked a little bit about this. I missed a few things in there, but really you need to separate your jiu-jitsu into the different phases, top or standing top, bottom submissions. Those are kind of the four phases. Pick one from each and focus on it because you want to, and that's a move that you want to improve on. Very, very useful. This is a long-term win. This is like an investment in yourself. You're investing now by deliberately practicing, that'll pay off in five to 10 years, but you gotta keep doing it. Now, positive programming kind of goes in with being there visually, affirmations, and never giving up. So we, we absorb tons of content all the time, right? Instagram, YouTube, you know, you're getting bombarded with ads, you're listening to audiobooks, you're reading magazines, you're on Reddit, you're programming yourself with all this information, you're getting exposed to all these viewpoints and ideas that you, you almost don't have control of. It's like your subconscious brain is just like, I want this, I wanna click this, oh, that looks interesting, click that, click that. Obviously always choose positive programming, but selectively look at what you're putting into your brain because that's like what you're feeding yourself. You are what you eat, right? And your brain is like that also. So if you're not really, if you're just absorbing whatever you see on the internet and you're just getting served up something from the AI algorithm, just getting programmed by our AI overlords, that's not really, uh, Po- that's not what I would call positive programming. I would say positive programming is where you go out of your way to intentionally select people or ideas or concepts that help you with all of these above tasks, right? People who are motivational, people who have done this before, people who inspire you, people who have useful tools and tricks, mental tools and tricks that can help you. Um, there's great books on this, like sports psychology books that can really help you. Um, I'll make one recommendation. Uh, Tim Grover wrote Relentless, and he was a a coach for Michael Jordan, a bunch of great basketball superstars, a bunch of great athletes. A book like Relentless that kind of puts you in the mindset of what does a true champion train like? And some of the the things, the reality is, it's kind kind of a dark existence, like fully committing yourself to a sport, fully committing yourself to competition. It's, It's very tedious, and you sacrifice a lot of 
things that you may really hold dear to you, such as like a lot of social life or hobbies or things like if you really go full bore into it and kind of try to emulate what these superstars emulate, you will go down a road that is uh, taxing to say the least. But it's still important to understand like what that mindset is and trying to achieve it. So po like pro positive programming is just you s intentionally picking stuff that you think is going to help your brain and help your subconscious on the day of the event. So try and watch things, listen to things that motivate and inspire you. Okay, so that kind of gets us through physical and mental. Technical is, these are just kind of afterthoughts, you would think. However, they're incredibly important. Number one, one technical detail that will help you win is count your points in training. When you're training, I would suggest verbally do this, even if it's awkward, but some people feel too uncomfortable doing that. But I like to verbally shout out my points when I'm training with people. I don't always do this, but when I'm competing for something, I like to verbally or at least mentally be like, okay, two points, or I stole the two, two, and I'll look up at the ref and be like, two points. Like, what, would I, what do I wanna do there that ensures that I got my points? That's an important just comp comp competitor trick. Just assume that the ref is your enemy. Assume that they're not gonna give you points you need to be aware of your points and where you're out of the board. You need to assume that your teammates are not gonna be there. They're in the bathroom right at that moment so you don't have anyone. You don't wanna be out there and be floundering like, oh shit, I have no one. I don't know what the points are. I'm just fighting for my life. It's on you to be looking at the scorecard and be counting points in your head. But it would be very difficult sometimes to be looking at the scorecard when you're in a battle of life and death, right? Someone's trying to choke you. Like, what are you gonna do? Look up at the scorecard and he's gonna grab your neck and choke you more. It's helpful to mentally know where you're at on the scoreboard rather than have to visually look and be like, oh, that's where I am. Obviously you need to confirm it and be like, okay, I, I, I scored this, I passed his guard, I got neon belly. I should have, you know, five, seven points or something. You look at the board, do I have them? Yes, no. If yes, great, you're doing good. If no, something went wrong, chances are if you say something to the ref, he's gonna penalize you. So now you just had a, now you got a fire under your ass. You didn't get those points. Now you really gotta get those points and win. So being aware of your points in training can kind of just build a little neural structure in your brain that just always calculates points for you. So at this point, I don't even have to think about it. I just know my points, but that's one thing that you can start doing that's a big win. Be aware of the rules. I can't tell you how many people go to competitions and just get DQ'd immediately. It happens all the time. Don't be that person. Take the time to read the rule book of whatever event you're in. Read those rules, understand them, ask them questions, email them if you have to, if you're unsure. And even if you do that, even if you're a better ref than the refs themselves, you'll still get DQ'd. So you can be DQ'd for things that are not even in the rules. It's just a reality of competition. It's a crazy place. Don't, don't let it get you down if you get screwed by the ref. Everyone gets screwed by the ref. Just, you know, talk it out, you know, talk to your therapist about it or something. It's a, it's a tragic experience to get screwed by the ref, but at least you can eliminate your personal responsibility, which is to understand the rules yourself. So at least, even if everyone else fucks up, you knew the truth about the rules, okay? The final technical tip I have is you are only as good as your worst position. And so what this means is like, you're only as good as your cross choke? No, like if you have a shitty cross choke, that doesn't mean that you're only good, as good as your shitty shitty cross chokes. What it does mean is you're only as good as your best position when we separate this into our four phases of takedowns. So what I really mean is these three, right? Submissions, you can get through competitions without having good submissions, but I mean, it helps a ton to know what you're doing with submissions, obviously. But if you have shitty takedowns, when the match starts, you're gonna be on your feet and your, your weakness will be instantly exposed if you haven't taken the time to practice your takedowns to get comfortable on the feet or your gym starts on the knees. You will be naked in front of the world. Your skills will be so exposed, you'll feel incredibly vulnerable when you go out there like, oh, I don't know takedowns. Even if you have the best top and bottom game in the world, like not having takedowns is, in, is just a, shakes you to your core if you don't know what you're doing out there. So practice your takedowns. If you're bad at takedowns, you're only as good as your bad takedowns because you can just get taken down and lose right off the bat. Same with top position. You can have great takedowns, great guard, but if your passing sucks, What's the point? You're just gonna take them down, get swept, and now you gotta rely on your guard. It's just like, it's not congruent. It doesn't really make sense. So practice your passing, practice your base, practice not getting swept. These positions dictate whether you win or, win or lose. Guard is the same. You could have awesome takedowns, awesome top, and this is a common one actually. Many people have awesome takedowns, awesome top game, but they don't have a bottom game. They don't have a guard game. 
And if they get put on their back, they're like a turtle on their back, and it's basically a guaranteed loss. But they just rely on winning the takedown battle and staying on top and not getting swept, knowing that their biggest weakness is bottom. And that's not a good place to be. Don't do two thirds of jujitsu, do the entirety of jujitsu. So have your bottom game ready, have a guard that you're confident in, and that's where deliberate practice comes in, right? Because if you don't have a good guard, that's what you should be deliberately practicing. You should intentionally put yourself on bottom day in and day out until you can actually play guard effectively and confidently. So those are my three phases of comp comp competition pre preparedness, competition preparedness that I use. And these have, these, this is basically most of it. This is like 80%. There's a lot in here. One I should probably mention that is the most important one mentally is absolutely under no circumstances ever, ever, ever no excuses. This is the number one rule. Take personal responsibility for if you won or if you lost. Take responsibility if you got beat up in the gym. Take responsibility if your cardio sucks. Do not make excuses for yourself. If you find yourself making excuses, it's because you neglected one or many of these things. If you check the boxes, you have cardio confidence, you tried to get strong, you tried to aim for high sparring drilling time, you were affirming to yourself, you were there visualizing, you wanted it, you never gave up, you deliberately practiced, you did positive programming, you're counting points, you're aware of the rules, and you know that your, your weaknesses, so you assess them. There is no point if you hit these, hit these other things that excuses would be acceptable because you've done the things that you need to do. And so if you still lose, which is likely, right? Only one person in your division is gonna win. Everyone else is gonna lose. It's a very small amount of people that actually win. Do not make excuses. If you've done all of these things, it allows you to confidently say, I lost because I wasn't good enough. And that is, a, that is a great place to be at the end of a competition. I lost because I technically, my skill was inferior to my opponent. And it's very clear that what you need to work on is whatever you lost to. 